Tonight, Apple downplays the mask attack threat. IBM plans to build two very large supercomputers. And what is with AT&T's fiber rollout? Is it even happening? Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 216 for Friday, November 14th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter makes hiring faster, easier, and cheaper. Post your job to over 50 job boards with just one click. Try ZipRecruiter with a free four-day trial now at ZipRecruiter.com slash TN2. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash TN2. Hello, everybody. I'm Sarah Lane, and let's get right into today's tech feed. Two days ago, AT&T claims that it needed to hit the pause button on a 100-city fiber build-out because of uncertainty over network neutrality rules. Now, the Federal Communications Commission wants the company to explain in detail its plans for this fiber construction. Now, earlier this week, AT&T CEO Randall Stevenson said in an update to investors that, quote, we can't go out and invest that kind of money deploying fiber to 100 cities not knowing under what rules those investments will be governed. Of course, he's talking about net neutrality. AT&T has also said that it'll bring fiber to the premises internet service to 2 million additional locations if it's allowed to buy direct TV. But AT&T hasn't said how many locations it would bring fiber to if the merger is rejected. The net neutrality issue heated up this week when President Obama urged the FCC to reclassify broadband as a utility and prevent internet providers from blocking or throttling content or charging websites for prioritization. Facebook's got a new data center that's up and running in Altoona, Iowa. The new facility is in addition to other centers in Prineville, Oregon, Forest City, North Carolina, and Lulia, Sweden. This is the first of two data centers that Facebook is building at this new site in Altoona. And also, notably, the first data center to use Facebook's new high-performance networking architecture, which allows it to run on a single high-performance network, not traditional clusters. Each server pod has 48 server racks, which are then connected to the larger network. Facebook says that through this, it can increase its intra-building network capacity tenfold compared to the old design. And the company believes that a 50X improvement is possible. So I don't know, status updates were never so fast. IBM is building two really massive supercomputers that combine a new supercomputing approach with help from NVIDIA processing accelerators and high-speed networking from Mellanox in a deal with the Department of Energy worth $325 million. Today, the companies and the DOE announced the deal, which will pay for two machines, one for civilian research at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee and one for nuclear weapons simulation at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California. Both supercomputers will have peak performance surpassing 100 petaflops or a quadrillion calculations per second. <laughs> IBM will build the overall system using a design that marries main processors from its own power family with Volta accelerators from NVIDIA. The Department of Energy will spend about $100 million on a program called Fast Forward 2 to make next-gen massive-scale supercomputers 20 to 40 times faster than what's available today. Earlier this week, we told you a little bit about this idea that that, that, that iOS users could be infected with viruses through their computers. Uh, one of those attacks was called the mask attack. Joining us now to talk a little bit more about what's going on with this is Jeremy Owens, online business editor over at the San Jose Mercury News. Hey, Jeremy, happy Friday. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks for being here. So you wrote an article today that Apple has downplayed this mask threat. This is mask with a Q-U-E. For anybody who's not familiar with how it works, what is this mask threat? What's the vulnerability? Well, FireEye, a security company here in Silicon Valley, put this out this week, that there is the opportunity to put out a fake app, a malicious piece of software that could then mimic a real app, not any of the ones that Apple put on the phone to begin with, but it was the one they used as an example was Gmail. You download a piece of malicious software off of the internet, and suddenly it acts like it's Gmail, and it gets everything that you put into your Gmail app, it gets everything that, you know, say your drafts, say your sent mail. Um, it, it can find those things and, and pull them into uh, a remote hacker's uh, library. So what is Apple saying about this? Have they responded? You know, what, what are they suggesting that 
the regular public do? Well, just to continue doing what you should already be doing. Only download software from trusted sources, namely Apple's App Store. Um, and if iOS tells you that it may be a bad idea to download something, don't download it. Um, even FireEye admitted in their blog that Apple, the, the Apple device will tell you this is probably not a good idea. And you should probably listen when it says that. Um, so it's, you know, it's not a big deal for consumers. It's more of a, a big deal for the enterprise. Well, if no users are affected, at least according to Apple, why is this a threat? Well, it's a, it's a threat in the enterprise. Uh, Apple is making a big push into selling iPhones and iPads to businesses. They've signed on with IBM and a big deal to try and sell these to businesses to give to their staff. Well, now you're in the enterprise and you've got these enterprise security companies who are also trying to sell to the same company the idea that they need them to protect their network uh, when they put these Apple devices out. Uh, you probably covered the wire worker uh, mm -hmm. vulnerability that, that came out last week. Well, that was Palo Alto Networks, uh, FireEye Rival, who put that out. They put that out there last week and FireEye came behind and said, you know, that wire worker thing that our competition is talking about is only one branch of this larger vulnerability we found in July and told Apple about. Um, and, and this is going to be a big deal when they get into the enterprise and you're not going to be App Store for your apps. Uh, if you have anything for your work, you know, you typically get that from your IT team. Um, they'll have an enterprise app for you. They send it to you. You download it. Well, what they're looking to make sure of is that you don't get spammed. You, you don't get an email from somebody else pretending to be that person in your IT department that then puts this kind of app on your work computer and allows people into whatever your enterprise may be. You know, Apple has always said over and over, hey, you know, be, be careful about the apps that you download and the sources and, and, and only from trusted sources. And that, that seems like really good advice. It always seems, though, that it, we get into, when you get into the enterprise sector, it's impossible to keep people from doing stupid things every once in a while. That's why computers get infected and it spreads all over the office. Yeah. Going forward, if we're now in an age where potentially our mobile devices could now be infected with malware or spam or, or well, we're already getting spam, but malware or vulnerabilities in general, does it really come down to educating people as to not do stupid things with files that they can't account for? Well, everybody should be educated on that. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> Should be. And, and, and you should be. And what uh, what FireEye or Palo Alto Networks would say is you want to educate your people on that, but you also want us behind you, uh, making sure that if this does get in, that we note it and stop it, right? It, it, it's the security of uh, knowing what's go what might come and warning people and their enterprises about it. That's all antivirus and, and, and a lot of security teams do is, is watch out for these things and inform um, and, and try to keep it from actually getting in and spreading. All right. So in general, don't freak out. You're probably not a victim of the mask attack, but don't download something that seems like an app from a weird place. Right. Yeah. I mean, and Apple said they haven't seen anybody who's, been used, who's used this attack to get to people. And so it's not really anything you have to worry about that much. It's just something to remind you um, that, yeah, if something looks spammy, it might be spammy and you probably don't want to download it. And something to keep an eye on for enterprise, Apple's enterprise ambition. Jeremy Owens reports for the San Jose Mercury News. Thanks for being with us, Jeremy. And before you go and enjoy your weekend, remind folks where they can read your work. Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at Joens510. I also have a daily uh, Monday through Friday breaking news column called The Biz Break. You can sign up for the newsletter at mercurynews.com. Excellent. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Thank you, Sarah. Coming up, Microsoft is releasing a new version of Skype for browsers. Yeah, we're going into the future with Skype for browsers. And more details on who's actually getting YouTube Music Key. That's the new streaming service we told you about earlier this week. But first, we want to thank ZipRecruiter for sponsoring this episode of TN2. If you're not familiar with ZipRecruiter, but let's say you're at a company and you need to hire some people. You need to hire some smart people, some, some good workers, the best quality candidates around. Well, you you know, yeah, how, how much time do you have? You want to cast a wide net, right? And you want to get a lot of responses so that you can, you can choose the applicant that is really the best of all the people who might want this job. ZipRecruiter works really well this way. It posts to 50 plus job sites. So, you know, it's, that's a lot of places. LinkedIn, Twitter, Craigslist, 
but you only have to post once. So it really cuts down on all of the work that you would have to do otherwise. The qualified candidates start rolling into ZipRecruiter's interface. It's easy to use. It's easy to see who you've got. You don't have to worry about emailing a bunch of people on the, these long threads or calls to your office and then you're leaving voicemails for people. You don't have to do any of that stuff. You can screen your candidates through ZipRecruiter. You rate them and then you can hire the best person as quickly as possible. You can find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by over 250,000 businesses who just love the ease of use. Right now, listeners and viewers of TN2 can try ZipRecruiter. In fact, for a free four-day trial, go to ZipRecruiter.com slash TN2. Four days. Find a candidate for free. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash TN2. And thanks to ZipRecruiter for their support of Tech News Tonight. All right, on to a few more stories that we're following on the web today. BlackBerry's got new products and services, everybody. Yeah, BlackBerry, they're not, they're not laying down. They're ready to go. At its BES 12 event today, the company announced the addition of BBM meetings and also a partnership with Samsung's Knox, which provides hardware and software integrated security for Samsung mobile devices. BlackBerry CEO John Chen also announced that the red BlackBerry Passport would be available by Black Friday, which is on November 28th this year. Chen also said that the BlackBerry Classic, which will bring back a trackpad and those classic navigation buttons that the, the BlackBerry faithful love, will officially launch on December 17th in New York, in Singapore, and in Frankfurt. Pre-orders for the Classic are online at BlackBerry's store now. Microsoft released a beta version of Skype for the web today, which is a version of the audio video calling service that I'm using right now, but it's designed for browsers. Microsoft already offers Skype on the web through its Outlook.com service, but today's beta will work across new versions of Internet Explorer, Chrome, Firefox, and Safari browsers without having to use Outlook. Skype for web will operate directly from Skype.com, and Microsoft is also planning to use Web Real-Time Communication or WebRTC. C APIs to enable browser to browser voice calling and video chat and instant messaging down the road. Currently, a plugin will be required until the WebRTC version is enabled. That's an emerging web standard that has the backing of not just Microsoft, but Google and Mozilla and other companies as well. Over 300 million people currently use Skype, but a WebRTC-based web service would allow a lot more devices to access it, like Google Chromebooks, for example. Skype for Web will be available for a small set of testers in the coming weeks, and the company says a worldwide rollout is taking place over the coming months. On Wednesday, we told you a little bit about the launch of Google's new streaming service, YouTube Music Key, and now we have a little bit more few details about who's getting it. Starting next week, Google Play Music subscribers get free and complete access to the YouTube Music Key beta. So if you're on Google Play Music already, congratulations, you've got another service. Music Key Beta is the new service from YouTube that offers ad-free music videos, but also keeps playing music in the background on mobile devices if you're doing other stuff or even when you're offline. The Google Play Music app will also include ad-free music videos alongside select tracks. Now, if you're not a Google Play Music All Access subscriber and you still want access to the Music Key Beta, you can go to youtube.com slash music key and enter your email address. Finally, if you do a lot of driving, then you might be familiar with Waze. That's the mobile app that offers real-time smart route alternatives to help drivers like you and me avoid accidents or roadblocks or really bad backed up traffic. Well, in Los Angeles, which is known for basically world's worst freeway commutes all day, every day, I should know. I used to live there. Waze often will direct a driver onto a side street from an adjacent neighborhood. You know, get them off the freeway, get them to their destination a little bit faster. The problem is, is if enough people do that, then those surface streets in those neighborhoods also become congested with traffic. Now some residents are kind of getting hip to the Waze game because Waze uses crowdsourcing to report traffic. Some neighbors are banding together to report congestion in their area so that cars are rerouted back onto other streets and then back onto the freeway. It's kind of like the future of Neighborhood Watch, everybody. Confuse the apps, get them off our streets. This is a neighborhood here and slow down. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Mm, gosh, I sounded like 
my dad there for a second. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write us at TN2 at twit.tv. Please do give us feedback if you have any. And of course, you can watch live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. Happy to have you all. Of course, don't miss our morning news program. That's Tech News Today tomorrow. Monday, rather, and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Sarah Lane, and I'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.